Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and I'm reading from the Amplified. It says, Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance and in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. And God's peace shall be yours, that tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so, and so fearing nothing from God and being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort it is, that peace, which transcends all understanding, shall, shall garrison and mount guard over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. For the rest, brethren, whether, sorry, whatever is true, whatever is worthy of reverence, of reverence and is honorable and seemingly, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and lovable, whatever is kind and winsome and gracious, if there is any virtue and excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think and weigh and take account of these things. Fix your minds on them. Practice what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and model your way of living on it, and the God of peace will be with you. Now turn over to Colossians, the very next book, chapter 3. Verse 1, if then you've been raised with Christ to a new life, Thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things, not on the things that are on earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. Jump down to verse 9. It says, Do not lie to one another. That's a good little scripture there. For you have, for you have, for you have stripped off the old unregenerate, unregenerate self with its evil practices and have clothed yourselves with a new spiritual self, which, ever, which is ever in the process of of being renewed and remolded into fuller and more perfect knowledge upon knowledge after the image, the likeness of him who created it. Wow. Most people that have been speaking or preaching up here recently have been speaking about coming into maturity and coming into a greater understanding of Christ and what he has for us and, and the journey that we're being on. Um, and the process as Christians, that God wants us all to come up into maturity, into the fullness of what, uh, fullness of Him, and the fullness of the knowledge of who He is, so that we can access and lay hold of everything that He has for us. Because it's fantastic that there is so many blessings and so many things for us. But we see today, especially in the first world, the church, we, we struggle actually seeing the reality of those things outworked through us, that we have a fantastic intellectual idea or understanding of these things, but, but seeing them and the reality of those things outworked through our lives, we get to see those greater measures. And, uh, and that's why I think it's so helpful occasionally to travel to a third world, uh, to see what God is doing powerfully over in the third world, to see the signs, wonders, and miracles, to see deliverances happening on a regular basis, to see deaf ears being healed and blind eyes being opened and, and, and seeing just, just this furious love that people would give up things on earth, you know, their treasures on earth to, to have nothing and pour their hearts out to a people that can't give anything back to them. And this is, you know, it, it stirs me to a point where I go, Lord, wow, I want to see that here. I want to see you working through me and through each one of us in such a powerful way, in such a furious way, that we can reveal God and the blessings that we've received to bless others with. And last week, Paul spoke about the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. 
And we know that God looks at the heart of man and not the appearance. And this is where maturity takes place in our hearts. And, uh, you know, he spoke a lot about where the church is and where the church has been, but also where the church needs to go into the future, and especially in the first world. And, uh, you know, we can only pretend for so long. Then the wheels will fall off and uh, we'll come skidding on our, you know, hind quarters. So there's, there's, there's a pursuit that God's saying, hey, come on, it's, time, it's a time to pursue me. It's a time to grow up into the full maturity and start to access and release that, that which I paid a price for you to have. God would rather take his time with us in the maturing process of our hearts um, than just get us to obey like robots or slaves, therefore remaining immature. That's why he's patient and long-suffering. I'm just going to read from my notes for a little bit and then we'll get into some other things. When you think about that in parental terms, in regards to our own children, what would you prefer for them? Sure, it'd be easy to have them just simply follow your commands. Do as I say, don't question it, because if you don't, you will face my wrath. So do it. You don't need to understand why you're doing it. In fact, you just need to do it. That would be far easier if we had children like that, wouldn't it? Maybe. Maybe. Jeez. But the problem with that is it leaves them immature. It leaves them in a state of fear, motivated by fear and intimidation. They have a fear of getting it wrong, fear of making a mistake. <clears throat> they... It actually leaves them completely orphaned and they, in a lack of understanding of what true love is and unconditional love. Because it's through our mistakes that we're actually able to understand the unconditional love of God. And that love ultimately becomes the motivator to becoming mature. On the other hand, if we teach our children to become mature and handle the freedom God has created them for, mistakes being the evidence of trying is a good thing, for they provide the tools for learning and maturing. Then when we see them doing the things that please us, we know that this is the evidence of their love for us. Because they're not afraid of making a mistake. They're not afraid of getting things wrong. How many knows God's not afraid of our mistakes? God's not afraid of us getting things wrong. Because he's already made a way for us through Jesus Christ. He holds no sin against you. He doesn't hold it against you. The process of maturity is all about making mistakes. Really? I thought it was about getting it right and, and getting perfection. No, the process of maturity is all about mistakes because mistakes become the teacher in maturing. And if you look at the life of a child, the life of a child is all about mistakes. Is it not? I've got three young kids, and uh, I won't get into it now, but let me tell you, there are mistakes after mistakes after mistakes. And my role as a parent is to not punish the mistake, but to teach through the mistake to bring the maturity. Surely that's what God does with us, is it? We must understand that maturity is a matter of heart and not age. And we know that God's desire is for us to all come into maturity because that is the only way for us to truly manifest the kingdom of heaven on earth. But we also know that coming into maturity is a choice. It is based on the decisions we make every day. We can either choose to come up into the things of God or allow the world to keep us distracted and grounded in our understanding. And I love the way... Um, Who's seen the movie Evan Almighty? It's a, it's a pretty good movie. Good, funny take on the story of Noah and the building of the ark. In the movie, Morgan Freeman plays God. And uh, he's sitting in a cafe with Evan's wife. Her name's Joan. And Joan's concerned about Evan, her husband, because he's... He's gone loopy, he's grown long hair, he's got this big long beard and he's building an ark because God has told him to build an ark in the suburbs or the outskirts of a city in America. And uh, she's 
portrays very well what you could imagine perhaps Noah's wife would have been like. He's lost it. He's gone nuts. What am I meant to do? Our boys are freaking out. Dad's lost his mind. And she sits there and she sits with God, Morgan Freeman, complaining and, and, and I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And, and Morgan Freeman says, you know what? It's, let me, it's, it's like this. And Morgan Freeman, knowing she'd prayed earlier for God, if you're real, bring our family closer together. And he says to her, listen, do, these things create an opportunity for God to work in you. I'm paraphrasing. You would say, Lord, give, make our family closer together. And it's not that God would come and give you warm, fuzzy feelings and go zap you with something to go, here you go, boom, now you'll all just love each other and get along. You'll be closer together. But what he does is he gives you opportunity to become closer together. And he uses the example of patience. You say you want patience? Does God just go, vom, here you go, you have patience? Or does he provide you with opportunity to exercise and to grow in your maturity and understanding in the idea of patience and exercise it? As a driving instructor previously, oh my Lord, See, the Lord knew I was going to be a pastor. So he taught me a lot of patience through driving instructing. <laughs> Not really. Love you all. <laughs> Can. So as Christians, life is more about the journey than the destination. And this is my take on what Paul said last week when he said the church is stuck in first gear. It's stuck in the gear of justification. And needs to change gear. See, for too long the church has been stuck preaching and focusing on the gospel of salvation, not the gospel of the kingdom. When Jesus was on earth, he didn't go preaching the gospel of salvation. He didn't say to the disciples, go and preach the gospel of salvation. Go and release the gospel of salvation. Go and take salvation to all. He went preaching the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. He went proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And then there's the seeing, hearing and tasting of the kingdom. When most of us got saved, we didn't hear a lot of teaching, and I'm assuming most of us didn't hear a lot of teaching about the kingdom of heaven and all that it involves. But instead, we heard an incomplete gospel, and that was the gospel of salvation. And salvation is incredible. It is absolutely incredible. But for most of us, we were motivated to come to Christ by fear and not the reverent type. Fear of hell, fear of being punished, fear of bad things happening to us. I'll expand on that a little bit. The gospel of salvation simply says, Jesus died because you're a filthy, rotten sinner. He paid a price for you that you may come in and have your sins forgiven and come into heaven so that you're not going to end up in hell. Now, that's a truth. Sure, we, we get saved we come into heaven, we're not going to go to hell. That's a, tr- that's a fantastic, wonderful truth. But the gospel of the kingdom includes salvation, but is far bigger than just the doorway of salvation. A lot of the church is still doing things motivated by fear. What happens when the fear motivators are no more? We're left with a choice. And it's incredible the journey we've been on as a church. I remember when I first joined the church and, and the different things were being preached here. I remember even going out into Salisbury train station at Monday morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. Busiest time. 100 people there. And, you know, probably the worst time because people don't want to talk because they just want to get to work. <laughs> but in my passion and lack of wisdom, I just went for it. And I would go up to people and tell them, ask them, say, listen. Have you committed adultery? And they'll go, no. 
say, but have you, got, have you ever hated someone? Oh, yeah, of course. I'm probably thinking, I hate you right now. <laughs> and I'd say, well, listen, if you hate me, it's as if you've committed murder. Then you're a sinner. And if you don't repent before God, you're going to go to hell. Where would you rather go, heaven or hell? Well, of course I'd rather go to heaven. It's a dumb question. If I believed in either existed, I'd want to go, go to heaven. Funny thing is I never led anyone to the Lord using that uh, <laughs> tactic. Didn't stop me though, did it? No. I digress. We are left with a choice. The gospel of the kingdom is about, is about salvation. Jesus dying for all, paying the price for all, bringing our punishment and sin, sorry, bearing our punishment and sin and being the perfect sacrifice for all mankind. But it does not stop there. Gospel of the kingdom focuses on Jesus' reign over death and destroying the works of the devil. His ascension as the first of many. His position at the right hand of the Father in all authority and glory together with his authority, making a way for us all to know the perfect love of the Creator God and being adopted as sons by a heavenly Father. And the journey continues. The kingdom is never-ending. It's a kingdom that will never pass away. We need to move from a motivation of fear to friendship. We need to move from being flatlining to flourishing. You need to become radical. Yeah? A little bit more radical. A little bit more lively. Maybe. Maybe a little alive. <laughs> what, motiv- <laughs> what motivates us in our relationship with our Heavenly Father? And there's a point to everything I'm saying, and I'll get to it soon. What motivates us in our relationship with our Heavenly Father? <clears throat> now, I've just been reading through Exodus and Old Testament a bit, but I love the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Now, we know the Israelites were enslaved uh, by the Egyptians, and God raises up Moses and says, all right, Moses, we're going to take the, the Israelites out of, of slavery, out of captivity, and uh, we'll bring the plagues to Pharaoh, and I'll harden his heart, and but he'll end up releasing you and, and letting you go. But more than that, he'll let you go with the plunder, with, this, with the flourishing amounts of jewels and food and livestock and everything like that. And so you're going to go. And so Moses is raised up and the Israelites are let go from the Egyptians and they're set out on this journey until they get to the Red Sea. God, what were you thinking? Why would you lead them straight to the Red Sea? Why would you lead them to a place where, oh, we've got nowhere to go? Why would you do that? But he did. He led them to a place where, ah, oh, we've hit a dead end. What are we going to do? Interesting thing, though, is the Egyptian, Egyptians suddenly realize, what have we done? Why did we let them go? Ah, oh, let's go and get them. Let's go and kill them. We, they've deceived us. So the Egyptians are chasing them down to kill them all. We know the story, yeah? So Moses then cries out, God, God, what are we going to do? We're going to get killed by these guys. And God says, okay, and the Israelites are freaking out. We're going to die. Moses, what did you, why did we bring us out here? We're going to die. They're going to kill us. What are we going to do? So Moses says, it's all right. It's okay. God's spoken to me. Here we go. Walks out. Red Sea parts. Israelites cross the Red Sea. Wow. Incredible. Yep. Then they are led into the desert, into the wilderness. And on their journey... Um, They get to a point where they're going, you know what, we're really thirsty. What do these Israelites do? Grumble. Grumble. God, God, you know. Actually, they didn't grumble against God. They grumbled against Moses. Moses, why did you bring us out here? It was better back there. We're so thirsty. We're going to die now of thirst. And sure, they're in a desert. Sure, no problems. But they grumbled to Moses. Yeah. And Moses then goes to God. Yeah. And water comes out from a rock. Then they get hungry. What are we going to eat now? What are we? Oh, Moses, oh, you didn't prov- oh, you brought us out here. We're going to die. See, water's not good enough. We're- Moses goes, all right, goes to God. Yeah? Says, God, you hear them? <laughs> Do you really want me to lead these people? This is ridiculous. Right? 
manna falls from heaven, they get to eat manna. God says, here, I'll provide. The interesting thing, though, there about the whole manna, when the people grumbled to Moses about what they didn't have, Moses went to God, came back down, spoke to the people and said, why do you grumble against God? Not Moses. Their grumbles against, were to Moses, saying, Moses, why have you? But Moses says, why do you grumble against God? Moses didn't bring them out there. The Lord led them out. Then they got sick of the, the manna, and we know it was, we need quail. You know, we need some meat. Where are we going to meet? What did they do? We grumble. We grumble. We want meat, you know, and Moses goes. And anyways, we know that uh, they get quail, and God says, you know what? You're going to eat so much of this that it's going to be coming out your nostrils. I find that really funny. It's kind of like God having a bit of a sense of humor with them. <clears throat> But then what happens? We know they wander through the desert for how many years? 40 years. 40 years to the point where, because, because of the fact that the, the report from the 10 spies spying out the land of Canaan, where they were meant to come into, the report was based on what? Based on fear that the giants are too big. How can we possess the land? This is not on. We can't do it. God says, you know what? Shame on you. Shame on you because you're motivated by fear. Again, fear seems to be ruling you. Uh, because of that, the generation of men between 20 and 40, you're going you're gonna to have to die out and we're going to have to raise up a new generation. And their wander through the wilderness begins and they die out. Now, through that period, God's working on a little guy called Joshua. Yep. And uh, God raises up Joshua and the account kicks off where Moses dies off. Now Joshua is called to lead the Israelites. Now he's leading a group of people that haven't seen the signs and the wonders necessarily of what God has done in the past. He didn't see the Red Sea cross. These guys, these young kids, they didn't see the Red Sea separate. They didn't experience a lot of what the other generation did. But there was something in them. There was something about them. But Joshua ends up saying, all right, we're going to do this. And he leads them across the Jordan into the promised land. Yep. Okay. Now that I've set the framework. I said earlier that for most of us, perhaps we were led into salvation through fear or motivated by fear. Let me throw this out. The Israelites, what was their motivation to cross the Red Sea? Fear for their life, wasn't it? The fact that the Egyptians were chasing them down, we will die if we don't cross the Red Sea. If we got nowhere to go. So God says, you know what? I will part the Red Sea so you can cross through. Now what happened through their salvation, being saved through the Red Sea, what happened for the rest of that generation and their lives? They perished. They perished. And I'm going to... Use this as my illustration to say, if my relationship with God is motivated and founded in fear, fear of hell, fear of where my destination will end up, that will only motivate me to a certain degree. That won't actually bring me to a place of having an intimate relationship with the Father and bring me into all the promises and accessing all the promises and the blessings that God has for me in the promised land. It will leave me in a place where I'll wander through a desert where I'll have just enough to survive because God loves me, because God cares for me, and God is not going to leave me nor forsake me. But when I approach God from a place of fear and I live my life out of a place of fear and not trusting God, then it leaves me grumbling about the situations and circumstances that I'm presented with. I don't find the solution in God, and I simply have enough to survive because of God's mercy and His loving kindness towards me. On the other hand, the Israelites that were led by Joshua 
whom God said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Moses said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. And it was emphasized, be strong and courageous. Because to not live with the motivation of fear and live in fear, it actually requires to be strong and courageous. Because it goes against the pattern of the world. Because the pattern of the world is motivated by fear. So Joshua, be strong and courageous because you are going to lead the people into what they should have come in before where fear kept them bound and hindered and hamstrung and kept them tethered to the things of the world. But you're going to lead them into something that I always intended them to have. A land flowing with milk and honey, grapes, pomegranates, where your livestock will just continue to feed. It's, just, it's a land of just absolute abundance and provision. That is what I want for my people, my chosen people. Before the Israelites were to cross the Jordan with Joshua, were the Egyptian, Egyptians chasing them down, saying, we're going to kill them? No. Was there any enemy that was chasing them down to the point where they thought, ah, oh, we better cross, otherwise we're going to die? No. So the motivation for them to cross the Jordan, there was no fear. It was no fear of death. There was no fear of, ah, oh, what's going to happen? Where will we end up? I would like to say that their motivation came from a desire to come into what God originally attended, intended for them to come into. Their desire to see, to taste, to, to occupy that which God said that they could have, that was theirs, overruled any other desire in them, any other emotion in them. Yep. What motivates our relationship with God? What motivates us? Maturity of heart is Evidence through our desire to come in to the, the things of God, to come up into a greater understanding, greater wisdom, greater knowledge of all that He has for us. Maturity of heart looks like something. It outworks itself as something. But what I love with this story is this. We know the Israelites crossed the Jordan with Joshua leading, and you go, wow, what a feat. They came into something. And they came into the land of Canaan. Well done. Fantastic. Well done, guys. But they haven't, hadn't yet occupied the land that God said to occupy. But yet they'd come in. They'd crossed. There was a desire that motivated them to a point where they, they crossed and they came into something. But they hadn't yet occupied what God called them to occupy. What's interesting is once they crossed the Jordan and they were on the fringe, still in Canaan, it says that they ate of the fruit of Canaan. They were able to eat of the produce of the land. Without occupying, they could still eat. And it says as soon as they started to eat of those things, the manna stopped, all of the other things stopped. Because now God said, I'll provide for you. How many of us in our relationship with God, there's a desire and it starts off and it looks like something. And we cross the Jordan and we go, yes, I'm no longer motivated by fear. Yep, 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 yep. See, I'm here. Yes, yep, this is where I am. And we start to enjoy some of the fruits of the land, but we haven't fully occupied that, we've got, with that which God says we could occupy. Possess that which God says is already yours. It's already yours. The promises of God. An understanding, a spiritual understanding, a spiritual maturity. All the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms are yours. But there was a requirement of the Israelites to be able to occupy. There was a greater trust. There was a greater level of, of obedience required to come in and occupy that which they could occupy. And it's interesting... The next battle we know was the battle of Jericho. And Dan White spoke so wonderfully on Wednesday last week about this. Uh, he mentioned it um, and about uh, frequency and all that. If you haven't seen it, it's on the web. Grab it and have a look at it. But 
God says, all right, I want you to go. I want, I, want to, I want to test your trust in me, your faith, faith and trust, same thing. I want to, for you to occupy that which I have for you and to access the fullness of what I have for you, it requires a trust. It requires an obedience. If you love me, you'll obey me. It requires a love that looks like something. And we know seven times, march around, blow the trumpets, shout, and the walls come tumbling down. And then through they went into the land of Canaan. And it's interesting just to note, Canaan actually means humility. It actually means humble. And that's the posture for us to access and occupy and lay hold of and release everything that God has given to us requires us to, one, trust God wholeheartedly, which outworks itself as obedience. But to get to both those places, it requires a humility before God. It requires a lowness of understanding who I am in comparison to who He is. That's when I can occupy and release all that God has called me to release. It's interesting, with both those illustrations and both the journey of of two generations of Israelites, you have one motivated by fear and one motivated by a desire to come into something greater. For us, for our personal life, I've got a question here. Do we really want God to be God or do we just want God to help us have a good life? For God to be God in our life, believe it or not, it's not necessarily comfortable. There are things that we have to overcome. See, if God's pursuit for us and desire for us is to become mature, then when we're faced with trials of all kinds, trials of what am I going to eat? I'm so thirsty, I'm so hungry, this and that. How do we respond? And how we respond determines how we mature. It determines what we come into. When God is really God in our lives, really God, We find ourselves doing bizarre, strange things that we go, I wouldn't normally do that. I would not normally give that money away. I would not normally be kind to that person when they're like this. There's a practical outworking when God has really got in our lives. If I want God just to make my life happy and just give me a good life, then chances are I won't actually have a happy life. And I believe that's where the first generation of Israelites wandering through the wilderness were like, you know what? We just want to have a good life. We remember what it was like in Egypt. We just looking at what we have here and this is not a good life. God, don't be God, just give me a good life. So we want water, we want quail, we want manna, we want just, you know what I'm saying? God's saying no. Let me be God in your life. Let your motivation be your love and desire for me and to come into all that I have for you. And let it look like radical obedience. Yeah? We're going to watch a short clip. Now, before we watch this short clip, I hope I kind of I hope I've made sense this morning. That if we're motivated by fear in our relationship with God, then we're always going to be afraid of making mistakes in our obedience to God. I, I, God wants me to do something. I'm not going to do it because in case I make a mistake, in case I get it wrong, in case uh, you know I stuff up, and God will then you know I'll, I'll miss out on what God wants me to do. Well, you know what? If you don't try, you won't come into anything. If there's no evidence of mistake in your life, then you're not trying. If Peter didn't step out the boat, he wouldn't have sunk 
into the water when he took his eyes off God, he wouldn't have come into perhaps the revelation of you are Christ, the Messiah. He would have simply been affected by what other people say you are. Well, others say you are Christ. Other people say you're the Son of God. Other people say these things about you. Well, no, but who do you say I am? What's your revelation? What's your experience of who I am? Do, what's, do you really know me? And what does that look like? This clip is a clip of a couple. It's taken off of um, the DVD Father of Lights. Um, probably a number of you have seen the DVD, have you? Yes? No? If you've seen Finger of God DVD a while ago, it's number three of this. <clears throat> and I'm not showing you this clip to say we all have to become like this couple. It's not about becoming like another person. It's becoming who Christ has always wanted to you to become. It's about occupying what Christ has always wanted you to occupy. That's going to be our pursuit. I want to be completely who God has called me to be, occupying what God has called me to occupy, releasing what God has called me to release in radical obedience, that it's so passionate it looks like something, that it doesn't need to look like that person and that person. All it needs to look like is look like God flowing through me without the hindrance of fear and insecurity and other things that keep me tethered to the ground. I believe we're coming into a place where it's time to get completely real and honest with ourselves and with God. It's time to call a spade with a spade a spade because until we recognize our own condition, not in a condemning guilt way, but in simple a diagnosis of where I am, I won't know, actually, hang on a minute, I need to come into something greater. It's when I diagnose my issue and my motivation and my whatever they, those things are, that's when I can exercise humility. God, oh my Lord, wow. I've let these things hinder, hold me back, stop. I've wandered through the desert because of fear of the giants, because of fear of approaching the mountain to hear your voice. Fear's been my motivation. I humble myself. I repent. I turn. Repent is not saying, sorry, God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me because he has forgiven you. He has forgiven you. He's forgiven me. Repenting is simply going, acknowledging I thought the wrong way, I behaved the wrong way, I believed the wrong way, and now I see the right way. I repent of the old and I, and I come into the new. Yeah. So this is just a little clip, and I'm going to end with this because I think it's quite inspiring and pretty much encapsulates my message. So when we know heaven our destination is a done deal heaven where we're headed for is a done deal then where to now where to now where to tomorrow where to on tuesday imagine if that couple that fear Determine their decision. When we let fear determine our decision to occupy what we need to occupy for the sake of others, then others miss out and we miss out. It doesn't have to look like that. You don't have to go to China. God's given us spheres. He's placed us in certain places right now, starting with tomorrow, wherever you are at tomorrow. He's placed you there to make just as much of an impact, loving those around you, not being afraid to love, but occupying what God always intended for us to occupy. Amen? Father, we, we thank you so much that you have chosen to lavish your love upon us. Though we know we were undeserving, but you made us deserving because of your sacrifice. 
Father, we thank you for salvation and for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for our names that are written in your book of life. Father, we thank you that you have put a desire in each one of us, though sometimes deep, though sometimes hidden by other things, but we know there is a desire in each one of us to lay hold of all that you have given us, to possess all that you have given us, Lord, to come up into the full maturity of Christ in knowing you. Father, let there be a byproduct. Let there be an outworking to our knowledge in you. Let there be a release of those things that we already know and understand in you. And let our knowledge and understanding of you grow and intensify. Let there be a a greater rising up and awakening in each one of us to pursue you and to be honest and real with you. No longer held in the trap of fear, bondage and insecurity. But set free by your love. Not knowing about freedom, but experiencing the full measure of freedom that we can all have. Lord, this evening, this evening as we sleep and as our minds are in a place of rest, won't you do a work on all of us, Lord? Won't you minister to each one of us and untangle what needs to be untangled, Father? Won't you break off what needs to be broken off and set free what needs to be set free in our thinking, in our understanding, with our emotions, Lord, that we may wake up with a new understanding and a new perspective, a new outlook on life, a new outlook on you. That we would be gripped with with the reality of the journey that you've called us to walk out every day. Trusting you every day, radical obedience to your voice. Father, we humble ourselves in your greatness, in your bigness, Lord, that you would even speak to us, that you would even pour out your grace upon us, your unmerited favor upon us. Lord, that we... would be faithful with that which you've given us in the freedom of knowing we are accepted and loved unconditionally by you. Where to now? Amen. I'll bless you. Have a good rest of the day. And uh, come down and have a coffee.